I have a treat for you next. Um, I am delighted to tell you that Bill O'Hearn has joined us this morning. As Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of AT&T, Bill heads up an impressive team of security specialists who protect AT&T's vast networks and their consumers around the clock. He has championed AT&T's transition to new innovative security platforms, and we are fortunate that he's here to share his thoughts on the evolution of network security. Bill's going to give a few remarks, and then he's going to join me by the fire over here, and we're going to have a little chat. Thank you. All right, thanks. They uh, don't let me out of the guts of the network too often, so it's nice to be able to come here today. And Ron, great, great talk. A lot of good insights in there. And I think what I'll share with you is there is hope, all right? I, you know, we think about physical warfare and, you know, armed forces. And when you think about physical warfare, you don't strap a helmet on grandpa and send them up on the roof to look for incoming, right? We've got the army and the navy and, you know, you feel fairly protected. When you talk about cyber warfare, that's a different game, right? That falls upon all of us. And so collaboration here in this community is really key. And what I thought I'd do today is just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the evolution of technology, but what needs to change for security to follow that and be embedded in it? Because I think that's really key. That's the difference here. When we talk about where we've been to where we're going, you really have to understand that the way we did things in the past are not going to fit with these new technologies. When we talk about 5G and IoT, you have to take a different architecture and a different approach. So I want to share with you a little bit at a high level about what we're doing. So let's start with where we were. To try to keep this fairly simple, uh, if you look at the slide here, um, on the left-hand side, think of those as objects that connect to the network. Traditionally, it's smartphones and tablets connect to a network, and then they reach something on the other side. In this view, I'm kind of showing our, our 3G, 4G LTE network. And, and the way we protect that is how you might think about it, you know, kind of a, in a legacy approach. A big perimeter around it, we have authentication, we do a lot of threat analytics. The shift now is when we start to move into virtualization. And software-defined networking. This is really key. If you don't understand where software-defined networking is going, you have to get up to speed on it. This is a unique opportunity. If you think about security, the internet grew up really quick, and security was always running after it, trying to catch up. This is a unique vantage point we have right now that with software-defined networking, we can actually step in and script security along the way. So now we're a partner in this journey. And when you think of software-defined networking, it's a unique opportunity. And I will tell you right now, because I live it every day and how we virtualize the network, that this is a more secure approach than the legacy environments. So when you hear the word software-defined networking, don't think less security, think the exact opposite. It provides us opportunity to get in, to scale, drive strong authentication, get visibility into data that we can never see before, because on the back end, through virtualization, we're driving micro perimeters. And when you think about virtualization, what does that really mean? Typically, in an element, you'll have software and hardware, and they're typically bundled together in an appliance. And what we're doing is we're breaking those two things apart. The valuable piece is the software. That's where all of the intelligence and capability is. The appliance is just a, a, a vendor-provided specific hardware. But now what we can do, we separate, separate those apart and we put the software on generic equipment that's scalable and flexible and elastic. So now we can expand and contract as we need capacity. We can quickly download software. And what we do with security then is we embed it right in. 
So instead of having a big firewall here and lots of things that you have to protect behind it, you can separate that software out and you can shrink wrap the security right down to the individual element. That's really a fundamental change and really key to software defined networking. The next step of this, as we get this deployed, and AT&T is really innovating a lot around the SDN uh, open source environment here. ONAP, ECOMP, those are the next generation network controllers. Those are the platforms that we're introducing with the broader community that are gonna run our networks. And they're gonna seamlessly integrate across um, with different capabilities. But for us, the key thing here is Security can't be off to the side, something that you add on after you provision a network service or after something gets on your network. Security needs to migrate up into the neurocenter of the network. So this is a big shift architecturally. What you want to think of networking is reliability, quality, and security. It's all in there. It's part of it. So when you, uh, when you define a network service or a connectivity capability, that has to be embedded in there. It has to be in the fabric of it. Data-driven security is the next frontier. As we're able to take advantage of machine learning, big data capabilities, now we start to drive authentication all the way down through the network into those individual devices. It's really key in the future when we talk about IoT and going from millions of devices to billions of devices that you really understand what is on your network. A lot of the problems you have today is because you don't know what's connecting to your network and you really don't know if that element is risky or not. So when you think about data-driven security, think about the brain of the network, really understanding what is connecting to me, where is it going, and looking at the behavior of that traffic to understand the risk level of it. And then in the network, you'll be able to step up authentication when you see risky behavior. That's really key to the future. A, a lot of the networks today are just designed for efficiency, right? So if you have a botnet dropping a bunch of bombs, you're really efficiently gonna be able to deliver that capability. So evolving this architecture to have these capabilities inherent in the foundational architecture is really key. And this will help solve a lot of the issues that Ron's got to deal with today, where you don't know who the actors are, you don't know who's behind those devices. If somebody has legitimate user credentials, you don't really know if it's that user or not. But there's capability that we can introduce and we can push through the network that can get more secure, but also effortless for the end user, which means it will be adopted. So I think you know, it's really key as we look at where we're headed um, into the 5G space, because now the speeds and the capability, whether it's connected cars, connected devices, you know, entertainment services, everything that we're gonna drive with 5G is really key to this foundational software-defined architecture. 5G is somewhat unique as well, is that there are now enhanced capabilities that once you are virtualized, you can begin to spread that from the virtual network functions that you've provisioned all the way up front now. Now we can do security on the front end, and we need a lot of partnership with these device manufacturers and the folks who are putting out the IoT devices to make sure that there's some level of standards and capability that we can auto update and ensure that these devices are being managed properly. I would suggest that if you all looked around your homes, you'd think about how many devices are snapped into your network at home. You probably have 20 devices, you know, wireless router and a whole bunch of different things with kids, connected devices, phones, tablets, your refrigerator, your TV, smart TV. Right? At some point, that becomes too overwhelming for you to think of yourself as a, a residential system administrator, right? You, you know, you're, you might put parental controls in place, but you know your kids can get past that. So, you know, we have to think about a different approach. And the approach is really driving this software defined uh, element all the way down to the residential user, right? you don't really probably 
change the password on all these IoT things you've bought. Maybe you bought a DVR camera system. And most likely, you know, it's got an administrative password that you probably didn't even know about because the you know, directions were in a foreign language and you threw it out with the box. It's probably never had a software patch update, right? So these types of issues are going to proliferate. The way we attack that is through a new architecture and a new approach. And I submit to you that the future of security is all around software defined. Um, so I try to keep this at a little bit of a high level today, but I think you're going to start to hear a lot more about this and we're really going to push into this space. And I look for you all as a community to get on board with this because it's coming. And it's, it's, it's really what we have to do. It's where we have to be as an industry uh, to deliver uh, safe networking. So I'll pause there and Meredith. Besides, there's some more piece up here if you want to file in. Um, that was great. Thank you so much, Bill. Sure, I really thanks. appreciate it. And so do we all. Um, both both high level, um, interesting and understandable. So we'll let's see how we do now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you touched on this. This is just one of my questions I always want to ask. You've touched on this, but um, as someone who runs really one of the most sophisticated and largest networks, um, what is a typical day like in an AT&T operation center? Or is there a typical day? Um, so no two days are the same. But you think about the vantage point that we have running uh, global IP backbones. And that vantage point, the visibility that we have there is like no other. We see everything. So we don't sit at the end point and only see what hits us. We see everything that traverses the network. That's really unique. It's a, you know, 137 petabytes of data you know, a day. Uh, so um, visibility is really key in being able to get down to a granular level so that you can understand what are the intent of these attacks? What, you know, what are they trying to do? Um, you know, and to be honest with you, when you think about attacks and you think about software, you know, malware, botnets, right? The people who write that software have to go out and test it. They gotta make sure it works, right? So you have a unique capability to be able to see that testing activity. So when you talk about predictive security or threat intelligence, really what we're looking for is, you know, what's that probing What's that testing that's going on that's going to allow us to get more information about who the actor is, what their intent is, and what can we do to put in place protections? Okay, interesting. Um, here's a question that I think is going to be ripe as we move forward in the next generation of networks. Um, you focused on delivering a reliable and secure wireless service. Um, Ron touched on this too with the Wi-Fi in the Hyundai incident. Um, what role does LTE play, and what are the security benefits that jump out? Yeah, so I think LTE, you know, going to 3G, 4G, from 2G, um, strong authentication is the key there. That's really been just a, a tremendous uh, jump up in the capability. So you think about encryption and strong authentication. To me, those were the two biggest benefits that we got out of that. Um, thinking about how you architect and deploy that and then pushing out into 5G, I think, are really critical components that we need as a community to work through. But to me, that was the number one uh, benefit that we got out of it. Okay, so since you mentioned it, um, what are the benefits we can look forward to in 5G? You know, I, 5G is going to have a lot of capability, but the first and foremost benefit you have right now is we can influence it. Right, so we're not, it's not being rolled out and then we're gonna run up and take a look and discover, ooh, this baby's kinda ugly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're right here, so we can, we, can, uh, you know, we can shop for the groceries and make sure it looks good when it grows up. So uh, to, to me, having input on the, uh, and the requirements, uh, driving a lot of the architecture and the design around it, I think that's our unique capability as we push into it. Um, so you touched on this with the digital camera and everything connected to the Wi-Fi, but um, can you talk a little bit about how our networks were, will safeguard the Internet of Things? And I know this is something that a lot of us are focused on here in Washington, on the Internet of Things and how, how we can safeguard it. So let's give us some hints and talk to us about that a bit. 
Yeah, so I mentioned the uh, Internet of Things, and I think the challenge there is that um, there are really no standards for these devices that you're snapping in, right? And I'm not talking about regulation. I'm talking about standards. Think about this. Uh, you go to the store and you buy a light bulb, and you bring it home, and you want to screw it into a lamp, right? You're, today, you know, you're pretty confident that that thing's not going to catch on fire. You, you have underwriters' laboratories, right? It's a, you know, a standard. You see it stamped on almost everything. That's not true with Internet of Things. You can go buy something. There's, it's been through no standards. You don't know what the heck you're snapping into your network. And we're snapping everything in, right? So um, I, I think as you think about IoT, you know, it, it's probably not incumbent on any one piece of the networking industry, but I do think that we need to think about standards. And we've been trying to put together some alliances to think a little bit more about should there be some level of testing? Should we say that if it's an IoT device, should it have an administrative password or not? Should it be patched? You know, what are the standards? You know, it's come so quick. We, we, we really need to think about it. You know, we see botnets, uh, the Mirai botnet growing up today, you know, uh, out of IoT devices just because you know, consumers just don't really understand the security aspect of it. So education, awareness, standards, uh, the different communities coming together, I think that's really important. And you guys have been great in helping to coordinate that activity for us. Well, thanks. We've been thinking about it a lot, too, uh, whether there needs to be certification or, or something like that. So um, we'll continue to look into it and look to input from all of you on that. Um, I have to ask you what tools you use <laughs> personally to um, combat cyber threats. Um, so at What AT should we all be doing? <laughs> unplug. No. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's best practices, and Ron talked a lot about it, right? So I think there are some simple things that we can all do. Um, reuse of passwords is a big issue. Right, we probably all have one, that two, at three, home. four. <laughs> <laughs> Weak passwords, the reuse of them. Um, you know, you think at home, right? And you know, you probably all have that desk drawer where you pull out and you got a big sheet with all your passwords written on it. Nobody does that, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of times you're reusing passwords just because it's easy to remember if you reuse it. But you think about now, you're reusing it for a retailer, for your banking, or you know, shopping, whatever. Um, but then you get a breach, and your password's out there, and you've reused it everywhere, right? So that's opening people up. Um, I think what we've got to look at is a, a different method of authentication, and I think the networks can play a big role in that. Um, so I think there. Are, there is a strong authentication that can leverage biometrics, it can le leverage network uh, components and uh, things that we see in the network to help deliver new capability around authentication that's really key. I think simply uh, getting that capability out there is going to help greatly. And you know, I, I think of uh, when Apple introduced the passcode, uh, when you had to punch a long number in, it got maybe 15% adoption. When they introduced the thumbprint, it went to 85. So an effortless experience, more secure, those are the ingredients that need to come together. I know at AT&T, we're, we're doing a lot of work around that. We're going to be delivering some capability to the marketplace. Uh, but I think we collectively need to all be on board with that. Um, yes, when um, my godson, when the, pass, when the finger passcode came on, of course, my my friend was taking a nap, and he just kept taking her finger to the phone, trying to get that thumbprint on there to use her phone. Um, so that's important. If I had your job, I would never sleep. So I have to say, um, what terrifies you the most? And and because I'm optimistic, what do you see as the most? What do you What are you most excited about? Um, you know, I, I have to be honest. I'm not really terrified of, about anything. I think. You know, the capabilities that we have in place today are really good capabilities. What excites me is looking out to the future and what I think we can build into the networks into the next generation. 
playing defense is really hard. It never gets enough credit, right? The offensive guys always get the headlines, right? You know, the quarterbacks always getting interviewed after the game. But the guys on the line doing the heavy lifting, you know, I think that's where it plays. So, you know, when I get back and I get down in the trenches, that's where we do our work. And I think that's really important. And right now I see a unique opportunity in the industry for us to have a big influence there. That, that is what excites me. That's a great answer. <laughs> I'm tempted to leave it there, but we have like one more minute, so I'm going to push it, Tom. Sorry. Um, one more question. Um, what, are the keys to, what are the keys to our future success, to your mind, um, to keep kind of enhancing the tools and solutions for your customers and, and um, the networks? Uh, I would say collabor cl collaboration is really key, right? And I do believe there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of things that get a lot of press that you just, you know, I open it up, I'm like, oh, come on, <laughs> you know, really, <laughs> right? But I, I think, so getting the right information out, working across the industries and the partnerships, as that continues to grow, I think we can get the right message out there uh, here in DC, across the industry groups, setting the standards and driving technology. I, I think that's where we're headed. Um, guys, let's give them a warm thank you. That was great. Appreciate it, Bill. Thank you.